Hey YouTube, welcome back to the video version of the Realignment Podcast. Today's guest is making his return appearance on the Realignment, speaking with Wisconsin Representative Congressman Mike Gallagher, who is the chair of the newly created Select Committee on China. So today we're obviously going to speak about China, how he sees US-China competition, the whole is there Cold War II discourse, and broader sets of issues facing the Pentagon and the military going into this decade. Of course, hitting the topics that really keep someone like Rep. Gallagher up at night. Hope you all enjoy this conversation and would love to hear what you think in the comments below. Congressman Mike Gallagher, welcome back to the realignment. It's great to be back. This is my second time, third time. Is there like we did a we we did a realignment in your congressional office back, I think, in early 2020. And then you, Mike Duran, and I did a in-person at Hudson. So this is my uh, downgrading status as I become a remote Zoom podcaster. Um, well, your, <laughs> your library looks very nice. I'm now judging you and seeing what we have in common. Uh, and I hope that if I end up getting to five times appearing on your um, podcast, if there, there's some sort of like prize or merchandise or like a gold jacket that comes with it. Yeah, I know this, the secret here, um, and I'm sure you're in this game too, is publishers send me free stuff. So you basically should be judging the nice folks at Penguin Random House, uh, not my personal judgment. Uh, let's get into the the topic at hand. Uh, we're obviously here to talk about the new China Select Committee. Can you just start off by answering a very basic question? Like, why do committees matter? Especially with <laughs> the younger audience. It's kind of like, you. I've listened to all the podcasts you've done. There's a sort of like the China Select Committee. The assumption is basically this is this august thing that really matters. But given, you know, uh, let's say approval ratings of Congress right now, it's probably yeah. easier to start with. Why should we have confidence that this act of itself matters? Yeah. Well, as a practical matter, um, given the number of issues that Congress has to weigh, weigh in on, as a member of Congress, you just can't really tackle everything. You have to specialize. And so committees are how you specialize, right? Traditionally, members will be assigned to two committees, sometimes three. If you're on a so-called A committee, you know, a really powerful one like Ways and Means, that's usually your only committee that you have. So committees at the most sort of practical level at the risk of being simplistic uh, are the way in which Congress organizes itself and members can specialize so that they're just not wasting their time playing whack-a-mole on a variety of issues and getting nothing done. The second uh, answer for why committees matter is that that is where we do oversight. Um, committees conduct hearings where we call witnesses, both from the executive branch and outside experts, to answer basic questions. We do it out in the open for the American public uh, to see. And so I think committees matter because that's the way in which we operationalize the checks and balances that are so fundamental to our system of government. And I think the third and final reason, I guess I'll be more specific to the select committee on China. Usually the speaker creates a select committee for an issue that's receiving insufficient attention from the standing committees of the House. So the permanent select committee on, on intelligence emerged after a series of intelligence scandals uh, in the 70s, uh, which woke Congress up to the fact that they weren't doing the basic blocking and tackling of oversight of the intelligence community. Speaker McCarthy has now created the Select Committee on China because uh, this issue is so important and isn't getting the requisite attention and urgency it deserves. And then to take it back to the first thing, it's a whole of society competition. So China-related legislation and policy and oversight falls like along a bunch of committee jurisdictions. So we're going to play a coordinating function to make sure that good ideas don't die in sort of the inner committee cracks and that we're going to coordinate the work of armed services, of foreign affairs, of financial services, you know, committees that traditionally kind of stay in their little, you know, stovepipes or cylinders of excellence and don't talk to each other. It's going to be on us to make sure that that doesn't happen. And the entire house is thinking about how we compete successfully with china so a couple of things i want to pick on with it pick up on there so number one as a uh, professional podcast booker i can tell you that i could book three episodes a week 52 weeks a year on the china topic so what has been missed the past four or five years because i think listeners will be like wait like there hasn't been enough attention on China, like what would you say the committee's focused on now under your leadership that's been missing the past four or five years? Because this has been one of the biggest stories we've been focusing yeah. on. 
I think the biggest thing that is still poorly understood, in my opinion, is the nature of, and I think it's something we've talked about in previous podcasts, is the is the nature of what the Chinese Communist Party calls united front work. This is something that Xi Jinping has referred to as a magic weapon. And it's poorly understood because it's sort of a complex mix of espionage operations and influence operations and economic coercion. The United Front Work Department is massive. I mean, it's like 10x what our State Department is. And this is sort of the mechanism through which they corrupt foreign society. So anytime you see a story about a university opening up a Confucius Center or some seemingly benign nonprofit like the Midwest Asian Health Association uh, that is, you know, promoting pro CCP propaganda. Usually you peel away one or two layers of the onion and United Front Work is behind that. And I think the various committees have have talked about it a little bit. That's a concept I guarantee your average member of Congress doesn't understand, let alone your average American citizen. So I think we have an opportunity to really sound the alarm when it comes to the nature of United Front Work and the and the way in which the Chinese Communist Party is using United Front Work to corrupt domestic institutions. So that's the first thing. The second thing, which has received a lot of attention, but I think is is the most complicated aspect of our competition or new Cold War with communist China is this question of selective economic decoupling. Um, it's very difficult. How, we, we've spent decades attempting to integrate China into the global economy. There are good American companies that have a massive footprint in China, have benefited from cheap manufacturing in China. Now, all of a sudden, we have this massive policy shift on China, and these companies are thinking, oh my gosh, I need to diversify my supply chain. Oh, or, oh my gosh, I'm going to find myself in the congressional crosshairs if I run afoul of the you know Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. So thinking through all of the nuances related to selective economic and financial decoupling, particularly when it comes to technology, data, and dollars, is something all the committees in Congress are going to have to pay attention to. And though it's received some attention, I just bring that up because I think there's a lot of work left to be done. I had some other ideas there, but I'll, I'll pause there. And Those are the two that jump out. Yeah, no worries. Um, I want to get at something you just articulated where you said, A, you've interchangeably referred to competition and second Cold War. And this seems kind of academic, but yeah. I think it actually does matter because like very clearly in the, you know, the, the, the committee passed on a bipartisan level, but like there were um, dissident um, progressive Democrats on this issue. And they very specifically were saying, we're in a competition. We're not a cold, we're not in a second cold war. So a, could you distinguish um, are these interchangeable? Are they the same things? Can they be stacked on one or the other? The Democrats in this case are suggesting it's one or the other. How do you think through the distinction? Because it's mattering if it's put out in statements this way. So I've made the argument for at least five years now that saying new Cold War is instructive and useful, uh, both for the similarities and the differences that it illuminates when compared to the, the old Cold War. I did not invent this phrase. Uh, I think either Neil Ferguson at Hoover or Walter Russell Mead, Neil Ferguson calls it Cold War II. I think Walter Russell Mead, after Pence spoke at your institution at Hudson, said, wrote an op-ed about uh, the new Cold War. So I'm stealing it from them, uh, and they have a lot of credibility. Um, I And I've written op-eds sort of sort of identifying the similarities and the differences. And the biggest difference is what I just talked about. It's 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 the economic entanglement. We were never economically entangled with the Soviet Union. Now, there are some notable Republicans who disagree with that framing. Bob Zellick, I think, wrote a response to my op-ed and, and thinks it plays into to sort of Chinese propaganda. And I think the reason you, you, you hear this referred to as a strategic competition, as opposed to a a Cold War sometimes perhaps reflects the fact that some people are uncomfortable with the new Cold War language. But my argument to them um, is uh, we should hope that the new Cold War stays cold, that in some ways this may be the best possible, a Cold War-like competition with a old Cold War-like ending, a la late 80s Reagan and early Bush 41 may be the best case scenario for how this turns out, whereas the worst case scenario is 
hot war. So if nothing else, the Cold War framing reminds us that we should endeavor and do everything possible to ensure that it stays cold and does not escalate to the level of kinetic confrontation, let alone nuclear confrontation. Now, I guess the counter argument to that would be, well, we look back on the old Cold War through rose-tinted glasses, and yeah. it'd be nice to avoid another Cuban Missile Crisis. It'd be nice to avoid any number of pretty hot wars that weren't direct confrontations between the two major players, but still killed a lot of Americans. I'm, for example, I'm currently obsessed with the Korean War, killed a lot of Americans. But I don't know. I I think that framing is is useful, but it may just reflect my own bias as like like a Cold War geek. Yeah, no, of course. So. A question that comes from that too, then, and this is the the danger or the concern with the Cold War metaphor. A, we know how Cold War One ended. It ends in the not just like the collapse of the Soviet Union, but look at Russia thirty years later, birth rates, death rates, every single metric you could really. This is what's really fueling like the rise of Soviet nostalgia. But if you're the Chinese, if you're like a, a member of like the Chinese Communist Party. If this is Cold War One, and they see how oh, sorry, if this is Cold War Two, and they know how Cold War um, One ended up for not just like the the actual like society, but like the party, if we're trying to avoid like this this moment of uh, let's say strategic vulnerability, where they're convinced they need to take gambles, where it's like, look, if we look at our population declines, if we look at the fact that we're kind of boxed in already, we don't really have any allies in the same way the U.S. does, man, we need to take the gamble if the Soviets didn't take in, let's say, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. How much are you concerned that embracing a, a story, a script we've already kind of gone through would play upon bad gamble instincts the Chinese may have? I'm less concerned about sort of the rhetorical risks and more concerned about the extent to which our rhetoric outstrips the reality of of hard power on the ground. Put differently, I think the best way to avoid, uh, you know, uh, the Chinese Communist Party doing something stupid this decade is to sort of place inconvenient facts in their path of conquest west of the international date line and particularly throughout the first uh, island chain. In other words, if you have a sort of a, an actual credible denial posture, then we can talk in, in candid uh, terms. I think the second thing is that uh, we should, um, of course, we don't need to be needlessly provocative in our rhetoric, um, but two ways I think where we can be rhetorically sober uh, and statesmanlike is to, one, constantly draw a distinction between the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people. And I think as um, the recent protests in China illustrate, um, which really forced Xi to make the biggest U-turn of, of his career and in, in sort of relaxing COVID zero or ending COVID zero, I think that shows that the one thing the CCP fears more than anything else and the one thing that might temper his ambitions is are its own people. Uh, and then secondly, I think we need to remind um, our allies and our fellow Americans who may be concerned about a kinetic confrontation over Taiwan, that ours is a defensive strategy at the end of the day. We're not seeking to take any territory. We're not seeking to remake any foreign society in our image. We're trying to defend the frontiers of freedom from totalitarian aggression. Uh, we're help, trying to help Taiwan defend itself. We're trying to ensure that Taiwan's future doesn't become Ukraine's present. I, I think that's a that's a reasonable strategy. That's a a a goal that we could actually um, uh, achieve with the right resources. So um, I guess I, I take your point. I mean, I don't want to, you know, you don't want to be just throwing out all sorts of crazy things that are needlessly provocative. We want to make sure that our rhetoric is backed by, um, you know, actual capability, uh, combat capability in particular. But I'm, I guess I'm not as concerned about that. Yeah. And, you know, I've listened to the interviews you've done around uh, the China Select Committee. I know you in these interviews don't like to talk um, about yourself as much, but I think it's in this case, it, it brings to mind a question that I'm sure listeners, especially like younger ones are going to have. I've got, actually got a couple um, state leg legislators who uh, wrote in with like questions because they're kind of thinking like, because this is the millennial generation stuff. How much does the history and the narratives you tell about the Cold War kind of constrain you. So like, let's say you're writing an op-ed. Are you like, oh shoot, like, is this kind of like, you know, uh, George Kennan writing the long telegram, yeah. right? Because because if you think about it, when people confronted those issues the first time around, they didn't have, for good or for ill, 
a a model, a storyline. They were just kind of acting. I think it's fair to say that. To, to how much does history and models kind of constrain you? Uh, well, I think anyone who said they they're unconstrained by history uh, is lying to you. Or if they are, it means that they're not uh, studying history. I, I think I, I think these these um, uh, these frames or, or these reference points um, are on balance very very useful. I mean, you need some sort of framework for making sense of the world. And mine tends to be historically focused. Now, that being said, I used to be recent on all this literature when I wasted years of my life getting a, a PhD in political science. There's all sorts of things that have been written about analogies at war and the misappropriation of historical analogies and the tendency for these to become simplistic. But I do think it, the early Cold Warriors were, were bound in some ways by certain recent historical examples, uh, Munich probably foremost among them, and Munich persists to this day as a, a his sort of historical reference point that policymakers rely upon. It's probably been supplanted by ones that are more powerful. Vietnam, I think, persists mm -hmm. from our generation. It's probably Iraq and Afghanistan are the historical reference point. I think that sort of explains a lot of the uh, isolationist sentiment that reemerges sometimes in the Republican Party recently. So I think I think we can use uh, um, historical case studies and sort of historical conceptual frameworks to make sense of the present moment and sort of navigate an unpredictable future. But it is important to be aware of their uh, deficiencies. You know, one thing I find interesting about the Korean War, and I'm not suggesting it's perfectly analogous to any present situation, I find the Chinese Communist Party's obsession with the Korean War interesting, right? Like the highest grossing Chinese movie of all time is a retelling of um, uh, the Battle of, of Frozen Reservoir. Lake, Lake uh, Chung. I'm not going to try the pronunciation. Yeah, fro frozen frozen cho Chosen Reservoir. Sorry. I'm like, you know, uh, right yeah. my Marine Corps vest. I'm like Frozen Chosen. So it's okay. addling my brain, um, which we sort of like as Marines, we look back on as like, even though it was a retreat, it was a fighting retreat. We inflicted, you know, devastating casualties on a numerical superior force. So it's like a sort of proud moment uh, for Marines. Um uh, but their retelling is like this moment they stood up to the West and it's sort of um, uh, like intensifying all this jingoistic uh, sentiment in China and and nationalism. And so I find that interesting. I, I'm, I'm sort of curious how how they use historical uh, examples and, and, and frameworks. And I think it's got to tell us something relevant about Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and, and their ambition. So, yeah, I think it's important to be aware of the of the deficiencies. But on balance, I think the best thing you can do if you want to be an effective policymaker or if you aspire to be you know, a grand strategist or whatever the term is, uh, is study history. Study history. I, I find that most useful. What uh, is a book recommendation you'd offer on the Korean War? The best, I think. Um, and admittedly, the author admits that it's it's a lot of narrative. So like on a pure historian test, it probably wouldn't be like winning a, you know, a peer reviewed award, mm -hmm. but this kind of war by TR Fehrenbach is it's awesome. I mean, it's just so readable. He has this he kind of tells it mostly from the soldier and marine perspective, like people actually in the fighting, but then he kind of zooms out and integrates the high level policy whether it's you know, sort of, you know, drawing the defense perimeter and excluding Korea, whether it's sort of Truman's early decision, whether it's Eisenhower saying I shall go to Korea in the 52 campaign. Um, so it's it's really easy to read. It's fun. And he's just so blunt in terms of his judgments of American culture, American military culture in particular, and really elucidates how after World War II, in this understandable desire to bring the boys home. We civilianized the military and we let our guard down and we were unprepared for this new kind of war, which was a, a war for a limited political objective as opposed to a massive whole of society crusade. And if you think about it, traditionally the American way of war is we get attacked and all of a sudden we get all fired up. This is what Meade refers to as the Jacksonian impulse. And then we mobilize and we go all in and we just crush our enemies. Well, the Korean War was kind of this example without precedent, except for the uh, the American for except for the war, the frontier wars and war mm -hmm. against Native American tribes. Um, 
where we had to do something different. It wasn't a full crusade. It wasn't a mobilization. It was this limited war for an amorphous objective. And the American people were very uncomfortable with it. So this kind of war by Fehrenbach, I think, is the best. If I had to recommend one, there's some readable one. David Halberstam has a good book yeah, on the Korean you know, War. That's then... his last book right before he died in a car accident. Oh, is that for Halberstam or, or that was, yeah, that was his last book, which is oh wild. interesting. Yeah the, yeah, the coldest winter, a really readable one. If I can find it, one sec. Yeah, please. Um, this makes for great listening on a podcast when I leave the mic and uh, go, <laughs> go get a book. Uh, it's called uh, this is this is a marine bias one. It's called Colder Than Hell. Um, a marine rifle company at Chosen Reservoir. It's by Joseph Owen, who was a second lieutenant then a first lieutenant at the Battle of Chosen Reservoir. And it's it's so good. I mean, you could read it in a day, you know, and uh, it just gives you that kind of young man's perspective on, on going to war. And, you know, honestly talks a lot about the challenges of, of racial integration in the Marine Corps. Because this is the first war where you, you really had integration on a large mm -hmm. scale. And he talks honestly about how, particularly among some Marines from the South, there was a little bit of grumbling about, well, you know, and, and racism, quite frankly. But the overwhelming feeling was the politicians had starved the military of the resources you needed. And so whether you were black or white, a Marine was a Marine and everybody had to get along. So there's sort of a beautiful element to that in this book as well. Let's actually talk about that for a second, because I I, I actually really liked the good faithness of your quote around your concerns about like, let's say the, the wokeness debate um, in the military, you know, you said you you kind of like came into office into this position and you're like, oh, okay, they're just saying this because like, that's what you say, like, this is just politics. Then you then looked into it and you still had concerns. Obviously on 15 different levels, like our debates today are not on the same level integrating the military, but what would you say the lessons of racial integration are for the integration of politics, culture, and just defense policy? Like what lessons should we take from that period that can inform people today? Because I really just see at a baseline level, whether you support them or not, I, th I think that there's a real uh, lack of language or just ability to have a right framework um, at the Pentagon right now for even thinking through or articulating these issues. You know, that's a great question. And I'm going to be, uh, I've never been asked that before. So forgive my inelegant response. I think on the most basic level, the it's important to appreciate that the military actually has a proud history uh, on this issue um, as one of the first institutions in American society to achieve this. And I think by and large, what the military still does better than any organization is taking people not only from with different skin colors, but from different parts of the country, different geographic backgrounds, different socioeconomic background, puts them together in a very difficult, a grueling crucible and asks them to work together to get a important and difficult job done. And that has, that generates an esprit de corps that I think transcends race, it transcends class. And that's a, a very powerful thing. I think on my own experience, you know, in my first and second deployments, I mean, my units, I didn't even think about this, time, but my units were very diverse. I mean, I had a, I had a Hispanic radio operator. I had a, 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 no, a Hispanic intelligence analyst. I had a black radio operator. I had, you know, one of my, one of my collectors was, a, you know, a border patrol uh, agent during this day job and was reservist. We had we, black, white, everything in between. And it the issue never came up because we were all just kind of working together to get a difficult job done. And I, I'm not trying to gloss over what I'm sure are individual instances of not only racism, but harassment in an organization that includes millions of people. Obviously, you're going to have have that. But when you actually dig in to the numbers and when you get past the bad faith methods that the Pentagon uses when they cite certain studies, you realize that the military is actually doing much better than the rest of the population on these issues. So I think the first thing is recognizing the military's proud history and therefore resisting any attempt to portray the military as this institution where racism is endemic and growing. It's simply not true. And the more we give into that fiction, the more we exacerbate our recruitment crisis in the military right now. And the more we're going to somehow convince um, young African-American kids in America that they shouldn't join the military because it's a hostile institution to them. And that's simply not the truth based on my own experience and based on the best statistics we have out there right now. So that's one thing. Another lesson from early integration of yeah, the Yeah, in the sense well, of like, yeah. how do you 
how do you like de-escalate political tensions with these like very mm. like with that that's basically that, that's like yeah. the, that, that, this is what I was getting at when I was you know you know shit talking generals who are far more qualified than me. <laughs> I've just noticed in like it's very clear that uh, well, once again the show is called the realignment. I do not think the current crop of generals at the Pentagon making personnel decisions are up to date on how to navigate a hyper politicized American yeah. political culture. What would you advise yeah. them to do to how to do that? I mean, this is what you have well, to do every day. I think the overall lesson, and I don't mean this as a dodge, uh, is you just have to focus on war fighting. I mean, my my own experience, I think the experience of studying that early part of racial integration in the military is that the, the military must be a colorblind meritocratic institution. And perhaps that's like a platonic ideal that we strive for but never achieve. It's like an, an asymptotic journey, but that has to be the ideal, because this we're talking about the specific business of asking young men and women to kill or be killed for their country, to put it bluntly. There simply isn't time for sort of woke identity politics games. Now, if the Pentagon and these these uh, these generals want to come to me with evidence that somehow like a perfectly racially balanced platoon that reflects the exact racial makeup of America. And this is what they always say, right? They always say, we need to make sure the military looks like the rest of society. But then again, if you dig into the numbers, at least for the enlisted force, the military, at least the Navy and the Air Force, is more diverse than the rest of society. So uh, against their own interests, they're making an argument for making the military less diverse. And when you make an apples to apples comparison between the officer population and the relevant civilian population, because to be an officer, you need a college degree, you need to do a few other things. So it's not just enough to compare it to the general population. They actually track similarly. So it begs, the, it raises the question, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, so I think you just have to constantly get back to what the military is there to do. And it's all about war fighting. There's a great quote in, in another, um, I didn't mean this to be like a Marine propaganda podcast, but the Marine Corps Bible is something called MCDP-1, Marine Corps Doctrinal Publication Number 1, Warfighting. And they talk about, you know, they say something like, and hopefully I don't murder it too badly, uh, mm -hmm. the military exists to uh, fight wars and pre uh, prepare to fight wars. Anything that does not contribute to the conduct of a current war is justified only if it contributes to the preparedness for a future war. So making sure you're constantly focused on that North Star of war fighting, I, I think is the best way to get past this current hyper politicized uh, moment. And I've come to believe it's not just a matter of a few silly PowerPoints we're making kids watch or, oh, Marine Corps Base Quantico paying their DEI officer more than they pay uh, their their base commander. I mean, this is turning off a lot of people that are currently on active duty or thinking about joining the military. And it's therefore um, having the opposite effect of what it's intended. But I'd be curious to get your perspective. Am I a crazy no, I, I right think, wing um, anti wokester I don't know. Look, I, I, th I think that the one bit of put, I, I think the word like woke, especially in this context, is like unproductive mm. in the sense that, like, look at your initial concern. When you first heard about this, you're like, okay, like it's just partisan Republicans bringing this up. Um, so I, I think just like in general, especially during a Democratic administration, just avoiding the word woke in this context and just I think being empirical the way you were, I think, I think is, I think is, I think is pretty helpful. And I think, I think this is, I think this is just developing. And I also just think that. There is a, all I'm really looking for from like the general class is an awareness of how politicized these things are. I think one of the worst things that the sort of like DEI, HR, industrial complex is, is they talk about these issues as if they're just like settled and like anti, sort of like antiseptic. It's like, hey, like this is how organizations are run. We have HR policies. We have DEI officers. That's the deal. It may work like that at Microsoft. It does not work like that in the US military for a variety of reasons, including civilian oversight of like that institution itself. So that's what I think the real, because once again, I think to your point, there's no like answer, quote unquote, to solve this, this or that. It's more of just like there needs to be a mentality framework. It's like when I, I always struggle when, you know, Pentagon folks like, speak to conservative audiences about how climate change is the biggest national security threat like that that may like may be true at an empirical level but that is like not a political like you that is a actually like hyper political statement in today's yeah. political context so i would just say like hey like maybe you save that for like chapter two and don't lead with that um 
another question. Can I, though, can I, I ask you a, a, yeah, just inject please. one point on that? Yeah. Because I actually, and my primary issue with all the arguments that the Navy in particular have been making and the flag officers have been making is that it's, as I dug into it over the course of a year, it's all, and I've written about this in National Review, if anyone's interested, uh, it's all based on garbage social science, like garbage. And the best social science, like these, we've had all these recent meta-analyses, which is a fancy word for saying they analyze all, you know, the most recent findings and whatever. There's like, uh, you know, you can you can sort of directionally tell what all of the base, the best peer-reviewed studies are telling you. Show that DEI initiatives like implicit bi bias training and other things are either either have no impact or an actual negative impact. They increase intergroup hostility. And the studies that the, the military is citing to, to make wild claims, like uh, diverse teams are X percent, and they put percentages on it, more likely to accurately assess the situation, as if you could quantify that. The studies are garbage. And I guarantee you the flag officers and general officers haven't even read the studies that they're citing when they stand in front of Congress and say things like diverse teams led inclusively perform better. And they're actually obscuring what is an interesting research question, an interesting empirical question, which is how do you improve lethality? What is the best makeup of a team to improve lethality? Like that's that's an interesting question to me that gets obscured by bad uh, social science. The final thing I'd say, and I'm sorry to go on on this. No, no, is, please. If, okay, if we have a problem with certain minority groups being underrepresented in the higher echelons of our officer corps, and in certain services you do, right? I think there's a dearth of, of African-American officers in some, in some services, and perhaps Asian-Americans are underrepresented in others. Okay, I'm interested in understanding why that is. Why, why is that? And certainly, mm -hmm. I think we would all agree, if it was because you had promotion boards comprised of racist white guys saying, oh, hell no. Uh, well, that would be unacceptable. That's I have not seen that in the military. I guess I can't prove definitively it doesn't exist. But if if racism were standing in the way of promoting people based on their the job they've done and their merit, I think we would all object. And I would I would fire those bad actors. I have no evidence that that's happened, but that seems to be what the DEI advocates are implying. But the reverse can't be true. We can't start promoting colonels and generals because of the color of their skin, because that would be a racially essentialist way to conduct Pentagon business. And we had the top personnel officer in the Navy go out there and say, well, we need to reinstate photos potentially during selection boards so that we can judge people based on the color of their skin. I'm like, it's crazy. Like we're, we're going back to a, a, a crazy time. So but it could be that the variables that are that are driving the underrepresentation are of different groups are things upstream of the military entirely, right? It could be lower for, for the officer corps. Again, you have to have a college degree. Maybe there's just a lower attainment of college degrees among that particular population. I don't know. I haven't I haven't dug into that aspect of it. Maybe, I mean, you tell me, like, okay, let's get into uncomfortable territory. Like, I'm white, you're black. Do you think I'm not appreciating the way in which the African American community like uh looks at the military do you think there's a stigma attached to it i don't know i'm all i'm saying is and i'm pretty sure by the way to your point i'm pretty sure like the the percentage of like african americans in the like military is actually like slightly higher than like yeah. the pure like uh uh you know uh population thing I, what i really like about what you're saying i think this gets to the first principles bit here that maybe like the wokeness debate kind of obscures is like look the ideal of a military is a mm. colorblind institution the disaster on obviously you know segregated military was a disaster on 15 different levels but from a first principles perspective the job of the u.s military is to your point lethality fight and win wars yeah. saying that there can't be black officers in charge of white officers you can't mix that made that made no sense especially given the track record moving forward so if there is an instance to your point of it's by definition provable that there could be like a bias set of instances in the like promotion of colonels to brigadier generals but then let's make it about that and not this random goldman sachs or mckinsey study from 2015 yeah. like you should basically what you what you're what, what i think is helpful for what, what you are basically suggesting to folks who would be on the woke side of this debate is get very 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 specific focus on the first principles here and and and, and focus away from just like once again this is the basic fairness thing i think you're most like 
like anti-work, anti-woke, like Vivek Ramaswamy, like activists would say to themselves, like, oh well, like if there's like a general who is just like provably like racist against black colonels, then yeah. that's a huge issue and we should deal with that. Cause that violates a basic fundamental value, fairness, American things. That's a good place. I, I want to hit, I want to hit um something else in the Wisconsin context because like once again, I talked to a lot of progressives about this issue and this is what their real concern is. So obviously a, a bunch of progressives like voted against the select committee because of the, you know, rise in like uh you know Asian hate crimes. Like that's like the rhetorical talking point. From from my perspective, here's what I'm slightly more interested in because I just don't see any empirical evidence that you know, the uh, a homeless man attacking an Asian woman in the New York City subway is like driven by our China policy debate. Um, I'm welcome yeah. to be. I'm, I'm like once again, we're making. An, I'm making an empirical claim. I, I I welcome evidence of that, but I don't think that's true. That said, you're from Wisconsin. You represent Wisconsin. Um, there's an interesting history here, which I haven't really heard people ask you about. So, a huge German American population um, in Wisconsin. World War One. The Germans start it. Screw the Kaiser. What's Debate Woodrow Wilson in a separate podcast, but like that's a that's that's, that's a just war, but I think is justifiably um, uh, supported on a couple of different levels. But that justified intervention leads to the lynching of a German man, all sorts of discrimination. Like I'm adopted, so this, don't ignore my race here. Like my great great grandparents stopped speaking German in the home because of discrimination in Pennsylvania. This yeah. is a real thing. Japan, World War II, not a Wisconsin thing as much, more of a California thing, internment camps. And finally, Cold War I, um, the Red Scare. In all three of these examples, a justified U.S. policy eventually transitions into some form of often government-supported discrimination against Americans on the racial, national, or like creed-based levels. What have you learned from those three examples? Also speaking to your risk, I mean, I think, isn't Joseph McCarthy buried in, in your district? What, what, yes. have, what, what have you, this is more what I'm concerned about, yeah. not what was happening in 2020. I'm, oh, here's my, let me put it frankly. Um, I'm sure you saw that CSIS like war game um, that came out a few weeks ago. And in the war game, like two US carriers are sunk. I'm concerned like what happens to an Asian person if 12,000 um, sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines are, are killed like in a mass, in a massive, in a massive battle. W what have you learned from those three examples I gave about that scenario? Well, to connect it to the earlier strand of conversation, were they able to, were their rockets able to hit our carriers because they were fired by uh, diverse teams that were led inclusively. Do we measure that on when it comes to like quantifying our enemy's capability? No, we don't. I'm pretty sure, by the way, the Chinese sure. probably do track how Han their uh, military yeah. is. That, that, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's actually probably something that's going right. on there. <laughs> well, though you see that also, that's like when we go down this path of like self-loathing uh, and like given to this fiction that America is like this irredeemably racist place, like we surrender this natural advantage because in this competition or new Cold War, our adversary happens to be a profoundly racist and chauvinist entity in the form of the Chinese Communist Party, which, by the way, is conducting genocide right now. There's not much worse than genocide. OK, to your point about uh, Wisconsin history. Uh, well, one, I have I, in my office in D.C., I have a, a political cartoon of Bob LaFollette, our most famous politician, being pinned war medals by the German Kaiser because he led the opposition to our entry into World War One. Um, filibustered it for a while, uh, opposed the the earlier bill to arm merchant vessels. Uh, most of the people that voted against it in the House and the Senate were from Wisconsin for the reason you mentioned. We had a huge German-American population. Um, and then as for Joseph McCarthy, the the first of two Marine uh, intelligence officers ever elected to Congress from Wisconsin, I being the second. Uh, I, uh, I I think, and the third example you mentioned was- what? Oh, just, just the, 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 the Japanese in World War II. Once again, yeah. intervention leads to federally yeah. or state-supported discrimination. Yeah, so I listen, I, I, I think the progressive argument against the committee is a bit disingenuous. I think it's more just a reflexive opposition to anything the Republicans are doing. Um, but if I were to be, I guess- if I were to consider it a good faith argument, and maybe there are some that voted against it that have genuine concerns about this fueling anti-Asian American rhetoric or anti-Asian rhetoric in general, I would say two things. One, as I said before, we have to make a distinction between the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people. And I think one of the things we are going to do on this committee from the start in a bipartisan fashion is highlight how the Chinese Communist Party is compromising American sovereignty 
to go after Chinese Americans on American soil. So it's almost a the reverse of McCarthyism. If McCarthy was making um, you know, exaggerated claims about Americans being communist agents, part of our job on the committee is to protect Americans from the influence and agents of the Chinese Communist Party. So that's one thing I'd say. And the second thing I'd say is I guess the the onus is on us in the committee and me in particular as chairman just to conduct myself and ensure that all of our Republican members conduct ourselves in a way where we're not irresponsible with our rhetoric or we're allowing uh, any sort of um, hate-filled uh, propaganda to uh, to come out uh, of our work. So I, I'm not, I'm conscious of it. I'm not concerned about it. Um, I think the lesson of of Joseph McCarthy is that there's always a risk of going overboard. And so as I think about this, as much as I'm going into this with a sense of urgency and I want to accelerate a lot of policy and legislation that I feel like has not gotten a- enough attention and, and and I feel like we're losing time and not time is not on our, st- our side, I also feel like the committee will at times have to play a restraining function. And put differently, in the context of a 2024 presidential race, we don't want this sort of pressure from all the candidates to be like the top hawk on the most important foreign policy issue of our day, which is China, to sort of push us off the reservation into policy that doesn't serve the American interest. So I guess at the end of the day, it's on me to prove that the committee is a forum for serious, sober, statesmanlike debate and discussion that ultimately defends Americans and defends, you know, uh, the Chinese diaspora from the aggression of the Chinese Communist Party, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it it does. Um, So I want to be conscious of your time. So two last topics. Number one, and this is kind of like a a, a friendly uh, concern, having listened to your rhetoric on the TikTok issue. Here's what I don't understand. I'm just speaking frankly here. I don't understand why you all are starting with like the ban language when from a how do we articulate this to people who aren't already on our side? You don't just start with Grinder in CFIUS in 2019. So like what I'm referring to is in, in 2019, Grindr, um, an LGBTQ, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to be generous here, uh, dating app, which is, you know, yeah. what we're referring to here, um, actually was is it like- not actually, that? Is it, is it, oh, it's, you're saying it's of, like- of, 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 of the- of, I thought of, you meant like you didn't have the the number, like what are, what are, is it a stop at Q now or what are the, full, what's no, the- No, 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 I more meant with, yeah. uh, I was trying to be generous with describing um, Grindr as just being a, a nice little dating app and ah, okay, definitely the most extreme of the various dating apps. But, you know, Cepheus actually forced um, the forced sell sale uh, of, of Grindr um, from a Chinese company yeah. to, to, to an American entity. So, cause like, whenever I talk about this with folks, like give the argument you give, which is like, come on guys, cold war one, we wouldn't sell telecom other like vital communications, like technology or allow it to be owned by, you know, foreign companies, this is the same principle here. So why aren't we just starting with forced sale, have, you know, the government, um, you know, at a federal level, like impose a ban, I'll, you know, shout out my future sister-in-law here. Um, Hannah, you have TikTok on your phone and you are a Marine officer. That is a terrible decision. That should not be allowed and has nothing to do with a forced sale policy. That's just a personal call out there. She's listening. My point basically is just that, why don't you just start with the forced sale? And if that doesn't happen, then you do the ban. It's a great point. So wait, future sister-in-law, does that mean you're getting married soon? Yeah, I'm getting uh, I'm getting married in September. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Very exciting. Where's your sweat? Oh, you you don't want to reveal personal details. Never mind. But marriage is awesome. Kids are awesome. It's all good. As someone who did it three years ago and is now, my life is dominated by two little, well, three human beings, two of which are under the age of three. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a a great experience. So congrats. Um, Well, to Hannah and to others, I would say, the bill that I've introduced, that's currently the only bipartisan bill, and it's bicameral, Rubio has it in the Senate, allows for a forced sale. So that, in my opinion, that would be an acceptable outcome. So you could do the full ban, which I'd be in favor of, or you could do a forced sale to an American company, as was attempted in the Trump administration, but failed. And we've sort of analyzed that case study, and Mm -hmm. we feel like in the way we've constructed the bill gotten around any potential legal objections. There's a potential bill of attainder issue, but our bill actually, if you read it, is not specifically targeted at TikTok. It's any social media 
app or company that's controlled by one of five foreign entities, China, Russia, uh, Venezuela, Iran, and North Korea. Okay. But TikTok and WeChat are like the biggest examples of that. Iran's, so it allow uh, for, Iran's for, tech sector isn't really, they're not sending their best when it comes to this yeah, issue. Yeah, if, if, you're on, if you're on an Iran, Iranian <laughs> sort of like dating app, uh, you're probably not getting the best set of choices. So uh, maybe upgrade to like, I don't even know, I missed the whole dating app thing. So I don't even know yeah. what the good ones are at this point. Um, but uh, so to allow for a forced sale, um, and I guess what I'm wary of, there's an ongoing CFIUS review of TikTok right now. And I think it reflects the same divisions that were there in the Trump administration. Like Treasury has one view on this, DOD and some, and DOJ might have a different view on it. They might try and split the baby and do like, uh, all right, well, if you have data centers that are oh, okay. Singapore or, you know, it, it, there's questions about who owns the algorithm and algorithmic transparency that I think may not get us the the concern, may, may not alleviate the concerns on the national security side, but a forced sale to an American company would be an acceptable outcome, in my opinion. If you address the- Yeah, I guess, if, as long yeah. as it didn't, you didn't sort of wind up in that split the baby land. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. another question, another question, this was another uh, listener question um, from from your episode. I think this was the Goodfellows one. Um, why is a social media company the same thing as like a telecom company during- the Cold War. So like folks are like, yeah, it makes sense that the Saudis or the Japanese or the Soviets can't just like buy like critical like telecommunications infrastructure. Why do you think if that policy is justified, like social media is the same, like th th these are that these are uh, of like, that these aren't just, th these are of like, like type. That it's it's similar to to what in the Cold so we, War? So in, in the metaphor, you said we wouldn't have let the Soviet Union yeah, yeah, purchase okay. like time or like a cable company, this, this or that. And I think folks hear that and they say, okay, that makes sense. We wouldn't have a debate over whether or not yeah. the CCP or a CCP aligned company could buy Comcast. Let's yeah. say there wouldn't be a debate there. I think where people sort of separate if they buy that Cold War premises, why is social media the category equivalent of cable routed through the ground? I actually think it's worse in many okay. ways. Because uh, I think it's more, it's more addictive. I think at least in one of the um in one of the interviews where I used that analogy, maybe this is proving the point of your earlier question, which is I got to stop using historical analogies because I'm always <laughs> struggling for like the perfect one. Uh, my wife's like, not everything's like 1952 and the Eisenhower administration. Okay. Um, I, uh, th it, those, those forms of media, be it radio, be it TV, be it good old fashioned print, weren't as addictive as social media is in general and TikTok is. In particular, and they didn't have the and and uh, I guess this is where I think the analogy is opposite. We just in America we have a concept of something called the private sector. Mm -hmm. There is occasionally those lines get blurred, and there's been brutal debates about government collection of metadata on phones, and you know where does the private sector end and the government national security equities begin? I get that, but by and large. We have a private sector. We celebrate it. It has a ton of legal protections. It's a beautiful thing. I would submit to you that in China, the concept of a private sector is amorphous at best and non-existent at worst. In a system where any private company, so-called private company, quote, end quote, can be subject to the whims of the Chinese Communist Party, where you have CCP cells embedded in their corporate governance structure, where the head of ByteDance pledges to make sure that all future product lines follow appropriate political control. I just think that it should make us wary of allowing a company like that to have such a dominant position in our media landscape. And I think it's actually worse because of the highly addictive nature of these apps. And I've been persuaded by uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff and the work they've done on how social media is increasing anxiety, depression, and suicide, particularly among young women uh, in, in America. So you have the collision of kind of a hostile foreign entity and like a an internal domestic problem with addiction and uh, to social media and increased social isolation. And these two things combined conspire to create a massive problem for America. So I recognize this makes me like the least cool okay. millennial uh, politician in America, but I've just been persuaded that this is an urgent national security issue.
Well, I have good news for you. There is no such thing as a cool millennial, uh, <laughs> millennial politician. Yeah, like Crenshaw's cool. He's popular. We got some, you know, people yeah, are actually. Yeah, there's a, yeah, but I'm judging by like the, uh, you know, the high school student government presidents are try hard standard, which I think as a speech and debate loser myself, I need to admit to that from a checking myself perspective. Okay, so last big question. And this is kind of like my, I'm Mugatu and Zoolander crazy pills question. We're talking about Cold Wars. We're talking about competition. We're seeing all these war games. Like there's a bipartisan consensus. It really feels like there isn't a sense of urgency and aggression, given how heated the rhetoric and the frameworks are. Like when, when, when Speaker Pelosi is taking that trip to Taiwan and everyone on Twitter is making the joke about how she's sending a fundraising email um, saying like, you know, the J-10s are like caught up with us. If we're at that point, it really seems like from a whole society perspective, we should be just doing much more like with energy. So A, can you answer my like tearing my hair out as a podcaster who just talks to people who do things? Like, it seems like there's not a sense of urgency. Like what's what's your take on that? And then two, um, if you were, let's say, your World War II equivalent, and there's like all this energy that needs to be brought to the table. Like, what would you just lay out as the agenda on all these fronts, whole society that we should take? So take it away. We'll close out with this. Well, first, on Mugatu, one of the first big articles I wrote as a member of Congress started with that crazy pills quote. My staff argued aggressively against it at the time, saying it was not um, appropriate for a member of Congress, though I was only 33 at the time, <laughs> to be using Zoolander references. But I stand by it, okay? So we're on same wavelengths. Uh, and it actually leads to what I think is the most important uh, aspect of uh, of this competition and, and where we need to inject the most urgency. It was an article about rebuilding the Navy. Mm -hmm. It's my belief that hard power deters. The administration's failure to deter the Russian invasion of Ukraine was because they relied mostly on soft power, the vague threat of sanctions and mean tweets from the State Department to deter Putin. And when you're dealing with someone like Putin or Xi Jinping, only hard power, uh, specifically American hard power, gives you the chance to deter. So if I were to inject energy and urgency into any aspect of this competition, it would be surging hard power west of the international dateline and putting hard power on Taiwan to make Xi Jinping, uh, Xi Jinping think twice, putting hard power in the Southern Japanese islands and Northern Philippine islands to make him think twice, putting more hard power in Northern Australia and US territories, compact states and Alaska. There needs to be a crash program in particular to surge certain missile systems. Now that we're no longer bound by the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, we can put ground launch missiles on various pieces of territory in the Indo-Pacific and get on the right side of the hard power cost curve in terms of threatening to sink their ships in the way they're threatening to sink our ships. So that is the biggest thing, to attack that with a sense uh, of urgency. And I think that gives us our best chance to avoid or prevent World War III. And to my more isolationist colleagues, that is what I'm all about. I'm dedicating my, I like, I wake up every day and I write out a little thing about like my mission in Congress is to prevent World War III. I'm not trying to provoke a war. I'm trying to prevent it. So that's one thing. The second thing on the economic side is I really think we need to stop funding our own destruction. So for tax advantaged entities, particularly university endowments, I don't think they should be investing in China in general and Chinese genocide and military modernization in particular, I would say the same for state and local pension funds. And then finally, when it comes to sort of the ideological aspect of this competition, we really need, and I'll go back to defending history. I think the right period of history to study here is the Reagan administration. Reagan was a master at ideological warfare. All of his speeches were carefully crafted to speak directly to the Russian people at the same time he was subtly undermining the Soviet regime. And he drew upon Russian literature and culture. We need to revive that lost art of ideological warfare. And it's frustrating for me to admit this as a member of Congress, but I've come to believe that it's going to require presidential level leadership to tackle all three of those things with a sense of urgency. We're going to try and do it on the select committee, but admittedly, there are limits to what you can do from the legislative branch in matters of foreign policy. So my hope is at some point we get a better non-boomer president who understands the stakes of this competition 
and is really willing to lead the American people in the same way that Reagan was. That is, I guess there's one last angle there. I lied when I said last question. Uh, I'm pretty sure, didn't you vote against the CHIPS Act? I did. Okay, so the reason why I bring that up is like chip back is very sexy. It's very like it's the conventional wisdom thing to say, like in these spaces. So can you just close on like the economic, like industrial front? Like, why did you vote against the chip acts? And like what is your like alternate model that you think would be better? A few reasons. One, there was it seemed like the Democrats in the Senate pocketed my my thinking at the time was that chips would be a reasonable bipartisan compromise and we would abandon. The, the the hilariously named Inflation Reduction Act, which was mostly a waste of, of government money and a Green New Deal uh, Trojan horse. But it seemed like the Democrats pocketed the CHIPS Act concession and then turned around and betrayed the Republicans and did the Inflation Reduction Act as well. So those things combined seemed very okay. irresponsible for us to be doing. The second thing is um, I had a, my own little thing where the, the Endless Frontiers Act, a significant... Uh, Provisions of it were changed, and I, I didn't like the changes. We don't have to go into that. No, we don't have time. Um, I wonder, uh, and I'm open to being wrong on this. Like, if, if five years from now we have a bunch of domestic chip, fa- chip fabs in America, and we're weaning ourselves off our, our dependency on East Asia for chips manufacturing, I will, I'll go out there and say I was totally wrong about this. But I suspect two things are going to stand in the way of that. One, the regulatory process through which these fabs get approved is still crazy, outdated, ossified. It's the same reason our infrastructure is the highest cost in the developed world, and it takes 10 years to build a road, because you got to get the regulatory approval. Until we pair the funding with regulatory, significant, meaningful regulatory reform, I'm not sure we're going to see the outcome we want. The other big constraint to this is a workforce issue. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, you just talk to any industry, particularly in the defense industrial base, they can't find human beings uh, to build this stuff. So maybe a better approach in my mind, as opposed to direct subsidies, would be a... uh, a more coherent and sensible regulatory environment combined with the appropriate tax incentives. I do think, however, um, the recent export controls on chip subcomponents from the administration on balance are good. I, I like what mm-hmm. I saw from uh, Gina Raimondo uh, in commerce. So, um, you know, the other thing I, that keeps lingering in the background of all this, yeah. but this wasn't an argument I made at the time, is is there a world in which we are actually undermining deterrence when it comes to an invasion of Taiwan by making this massive effort to wean ourselves off TSMC chip dominance, right? Like they, I mean, the Ty, the Taiwanese refer to it as their silicone shield. I'm yeah. not saying it's not worth doing it, but that's just one thing worth thinking through when we think about deterrence. And we tend to think about deterrence purely in military terms, and we rarely do a good job of uh, integrating the economic and financial aspects of deterrence. I'm so glad you said this because like my little like conjecture ba- based on the Ukraine debate is that isolationists are going to say why aren't we doing this at home? Let's not defend Taiwan. They're basically going to they're going to they are clearly going once they focus on that issue, they are clearly going to tie those things together and we'll have this weird situation where there's like there's this like not serious what's built it at home and let's not defend Taiwan um thing that's going to like mix together. I think it's important in the mid, mid 2020. So that's just something that I just kind of like noticed rhetorically. But you know, uh Congressman, hey, I have this a bit, final yeah. question for you. Yeah. What when it comes to your wedding, are you thinking live band uh, I have some advice uh, on this front. What are the staples in your opinion? Yeah, this is the, this is the, so I'm doing, a. am doing, I'm not, okay, this is okay. Uh, if you've got a second, I'm very interested in your thoughts on this. So yeah. went to a lot of, pen, went, video, went, but... went to, uh, yeah. So it's quick thing doing a, uh, DJ. That's the, okay. that's the take. I could see both sides. I live man, super expensive. At the end of the day, I was persuaded that it was a good investment. I would make, t- maybe harvest some savings from flowers and centerpieces you don't need or I don't think are important. And I, I would plow all of that into band and, and booze. That would be my recommendation that's, for a wedding. But admittedly, that's not probably not the best thing uh, to say to your significant other. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, that's just my only my only thought. Folks, news you can use from Congressman Mike Gallagher. Thanks so much for joining me on The Realignment. Thanks, Marshall. It was fun. 